My name is Peter Groenewegen. I'm director of Nivel, the Netherlands Institute for Health Services Research. I'm moderating this session. We have two presentations in this session. Um, the first is on my right side uh, by Paul Garthwaite. He's a professor of statistics at the Open University for the last 10 years now, and he has previously worked at the University of Aberdeen and in different positions as a visiting professor. He's co-authored books and lots of papers, of course. Um, he's co-investor in work in climatology, uh, statistical analysis of single case studies, development of survey, surveillance methods for disease outbreaks. So a, a broad and, and very long and steady experience in, in the area of, in the broad area of statistics. Um, Paul, the floor is yours. First, we're talking about expert opinion and why might put want to quantify it. Um, I'm, a lot of the time I'm a Bayesian statistician, which means that we have a, a formal mechanism for trying to use expert knowledge. Uh, in Bayesian statistics, you have a prior distribution, which should contain all the available information that we have uh, before we gather our data. And then you have a, that you gather the data, combine the two to form a posterior distribution. And that's the distribution you should use to form inferences, make judgments, because it contains both the information you before the data and the information the data has supplied to you. Um, one problem, of course, is that if you try to use expert knowledge, you also allow the possibility of introducing the biases the person has into your analysis. Um, and for that reason, they, 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 there's, there's two reasons why expert knowledge isn't used more. One is it's actually quite hard to quantify expert opinion, and the other is this risk of introducing bias. Um, I've been, these are various, there have been various contexts I've been involved in where the use of expert knowledge was clearly a good thing to be doing, um, and bias was either less important or didn't matter. Um, the first time I got involved in the area was with industrial chemists. So they were designing experiments sequentially. Um, their aim was to try to end up with a, a reaction which produced 80% pure compound at the end of the day and they wanted to try to vary the, the constituents to try to achieve that particular um, desired purity. Um, and if they could achieve it, they then built a mini plant to try to explore it further. So their first aim was to try to choose temperatures, pressures, uh, quantities of reactants and catalysts to try to do this. Um, if you quantify their opinion well, the design of experiments would lead them to the correct result faster than if they quantified their opinions badly. So in many ways, bias didn't matter. When you got there, you knew you'd got there. If they did their job well, you'd end up um, saving them time. If they quantified the beings badly, they'd take much longer. Uh, another example which I was involved in, involved, um, was it when I was in Queensland, there the Australian government was trying to find out about where the habitat distribution was of rare and endangered species. By definition, you can't observe rare and endangered species very well, so gathering data was obviously going to be quite tricky. And ecologists, on the other hand, would have had years of experience, had a, very, a, a good idea of where they'd seen animals in the past, um, where they're very unlikely to see them. Quantifying their opinion was a useful thing to do because they had lots of knowledge um, which you couldn't utilize in any other way. The most common reason for quantifying expert opinion, though, is because you have no other choice. You've got no data, you have experts, you have problems you have to answer, and you want to throw it in. That's the, that's the, the motivating example I'll use here. Um, and it stems from work I was doing with a group in Sheffield. And basically, the National Health Service in the UK was trying to um, assess its provision for bowel cancer services. Um, and what, so basically, it was trying to find out what it's currently doing, where time is spent most, uh, where the costs are uh, being incurred to the greatest extent, how could it modify its services to improve patient um, responses and presumably save money as well. Um, and what they did was they construct a large pathway model. So at one end you had a patient who has um, got some symptoms, a while later they go to their GP, the GP might choose to refer them to the hospital or not, to go to the hospital, the variety of tests they could have, um, variety of outcomes these tests could produce, different treatments, um, and finally some outcome of, of, of cure or not. Um, this is the kind of thing which would be one part of the pathway model. So here's, here's a, a set sequence of tests they might do. Um, and so in the first instance, they, they might have 
either they choose to be given diagnostic tests or not. If they're given a diagnostic test, it might be an endoscopy or a scan, and then they're different forms of endoscopy. And after they've had the endoscopy, they might go back and have some of these other tests as well. So the notion is that um, you've got a long pathway. This is only a small section of it. You've got the path leading up to the path leading afterwards. Um, associate along each of these different branches, there'll be a probability. So if a person reaches one of these particular nodes, they might go with there with one probability and there with another probability. To actually use the model, they need to have these probabilities along all the branches. Now, from, from background data um, gathered over many years, they could fill in probabilities along most of these branches, but not all. So there'd be one or two cases where they needed to try to use expert knowledge to try to fill in these probabilities so they could actually use this model. Um, and that was one of the tasks which I was involved in helping them do. Um, and one feature of this model is that we had to partition all of these, part, these, these branches down to just having two choices. Um, you can see from diagnostic tests you could instead choose to go to these four possibilities rather than just these two. Um, the method we had, uh, methods we had available at the time didn't allow us to quantify our opinion about more than two categories simultaneously. I'm mentioning one now which we developed, which is very simple, uh, but does the latter, um, the latter problem. Talking about the basic strategies to try to quantify expert opinion, um, normally you get, have data available to you, and this data comes from some form of sampling model. Uh, the most common one you'll be encounter will be um, where you're just sampling from uh, a regression model of some sort, a logistic model, um, maybe a monomial model where things form into one of a number of different categories. This model's got parameters. So it's got regression coefficients in regression models, um, probably the case of monomial models. And these are the unknown quantities about which you'd like to quantify the expert's opinion. Um, so what you do is you formulate a distribution which um, relates to these parameters. Um, the most common situation is where you would use a multivariate normal distribution. So if you've got just two parameters, there, an A and a B in your regression model, um, you'd say we've got a bivariate normal distribution. Uh, the mean values of these things, that would be the variance of A, the variance of B, and the covariance between these two quantities. Um, and those quantities are given by the expert. They represent the expert's opinion about A and B should be, and what the variance associated with those estimates he's giving you are. I'll briefly mention psychologists' work in this area because they've done quite a lot of it. Um, so, so basically, it seems that when people try and quantify their opinions, they have a number of, of strategies they might use, not an enormous number. The strategies tend to work reasonably well, uh, but they tend to have a few biases associated with them as well. Um, a problem is that psychologists want to know what we do badly and try to understand what's going wrong, whereas from uh, a statistician's point of view, what we're really wanting to do is find tasks that people do well so we can use those in designing methods of quantifying people's opinions. Um, I mentioned one of these tasks just to illustrate the kind of thing that's happening. So one method of trying to quantify your opinion is if you ask what's the probability that a person A belongs to category B, is you try to see how similar are these two categories and you assess your probability on the similarity between the two things. Um, the example I've got here is one of the better known examples um, where you've got that a person X is described as meticulous, introverted, meek and solemn and you ask what's his occupation going to be out of this list and you've got farmer, salesman, pilot, librarian and doctor and your eyes light up when you see the word librarian because this person is your stereotype librarian. So in, in ex, ex, experiments where people are asked to try and say what's the probability, which is the, the most likely category for this person, they'll choose librarian, they ignore the fact that it, before you're actually given any description, the chance of the person to salesman is enormous because there's so many more salesmen than there are of these other categories. So even after the description, the chances are still the person is most likely to be a salesman rather than anything else one imagines. Um, the other example is also even better known. If you actually Google the word Linda and Bank Teller, you get loads of references to this particular example. Um, so Linda's described as 31 years old, single outspoken, um, interested in social justice, things of this nature. And you ask, what's the chance this person is a bank teller? And what's the chance the person's a bank teller and, a feminist, and in the feminist movement? And you think this person's quite likely to be in the feminist movement, not likely to be a bank teller, so B becomes more likely than A in your opinions even though um, it's fairly clear if you're 
if Belinda falls in the category B, she falls in the category A, so A must be more likely. So again, there are things which, which upset people's judgments. Um, other features which cause problems are recency. So if there's been an air crash, people overestimate the probability of an air crash. Um, things of this nature. The particular methods which I'm wanting to have some idea about how constant the person is in those opinions. Um, and, and the method I use is called the method of bisection. It involves people only required to make equal odds judgments the whole time. Um, so let's suppose I was asking one of you, what's the probability that a student in, in Malta is a science student? So you might give me your, and I'd like you to estimate a probability of that happening. You don't know exactly. You're experienced by universities. I reckon that point three is my best guess of the probability of the student being a science student. And if you said that, I'd then ask you the question, well, would you rather bet the st that of the proportion of, science student, of students who are science students, is that more likely to be above 0.3 or below 0.3? And if you'd rather bet on the probability of being above 0.3, I suggest you ought to increase this value until you're indifferent between whether you bet above or below. So it's, it's a judgment you can eventually make. You can answer that particular question, even if you've never been to Malta, you've, you've got some experience at universities around the world. Um, so that would be my, the median assessment. Then you'd be wanting to, to try and I, I, I'd need some idea about how constant you are in that assessment. So if you believe that you, know, you are pretty certain that the value lay between 0.31 and 0.29, that means you've got real certainty about it. Uh, and if you didn't uh, live in Malta, I'd be surprised. Um, so if, you, on the other hand, you expressed beliefs that the value was between 0.25 and 0.35, that's more credible. The idea is you choose a value L and a value U. That's a lower quarter and an upper quarter. And the idea is in the same way as the median divided the range into two equal probabilities, these three points should divide your opinion into four equal probabilities. So you should be prepared to bet on it belonging in that category, or that category, or that one, or that one, and be indifferent about which ones you chose. If one category you'd favour more than others, you should make that smaller. So that's, that's why it's called, uh, it's called equal odds judgments. You're just trying to judge things which you believe should be equal at the end of the day. How can we apply this in a real problem? Um, the example I'll be looking at is where we've got a number of different categories and we're trying to decide on the probability of each different category being the thing. So in the case of the diagnostic, we had four different tests a person could be given. What's the probability the person be given the first, one of those tests rather than another? I should quantify a person's opinion from Malta. He's, does the, he's run the surveys in Malta the last few years. Um, and we'll talk about misclassification rates. So this situation is, is where you can give surveys out to people using questionnaires. It's very easy to do. And on the basis of the survey, you'll get some opinions back. Um, but people will often give misreport, either deliberately or because of mis misconceptions about themselves. Um, this example concerned the idea of the body mass index. So if a person gives you assessments of their height, tells you their height and weight, and, and on the basis of that, you decide that they are in the normal category, we're interested in the probability the person is actually obese, overweight, or underweight, or normal. So of these four categories, given the person said they're normal, what's the chance they're actually going to be one of these? Um, so his opinion is being quantified to try to decide on this mis misclassification rate so that you can adjust your questionnaire results. And the first thing that um, we need to do is a median assessment. So the person says he's got a normal um, body weight based on BMI, and then we assess a median. Oops, here he was assessing a value of 0.6 as a probability that somebody really is normal when they say they're normal. Um, we then go on to ask about the other ones. So there he's giving a value of 0.2 for the person being overweight. And the red thing means we're, we're saying, supposing that was really an accurate assessment, what would be the assessment of this quantity here? So we know the value must be less than 0.4 because that's 0.6. The total must be less than 0.1. And we go on to assess, he gives his median um, of obese, so about 0.8 or so. If a person says they're normal weight, his estimate of the point that they're, they're obese is 0.7 or 8. And consequently, the figure at the yellow, we know these things must add up to 100%, so that's giving us the overall percentage. So that's giving us the, um, the median estimates. Going on to look at the uncertainty about those, here he's giving a lower and an upper estimate for this 
percentage. So he believes his best estimate of the, of the proportion of people saying normal who are normal is 0 0.6, and 0 0.65 to 0.55 are the lower upper quartiles. So, so that's his, his uncertainty. We do the same for the other categories. Also, once you've got these things here, we can relate his opinion about um, the overall distribution for this category. So we have these three points on the, on the distribution. We can put a, a distribution through that and say, does that represent the kind of shape you're after? Um, going on to this next one here, we also mark this line here. If he were to put this upper quarter above there, suddenly this point here, instead of it being a nice bell shape, it would suddenly have a, a sharp peak in one direction. So the, 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 the yellow line is warning him that it should really be inside that level in order to come up with something which is going to meet his opinions. Um, you go on to the other ones and so forth. Um, after you've done that, you then try to give feedback. So you've got assessments from the person. You then want to try and present them with some information which gives them ideas about um, whether, they, whether the consequences of their expressed judgments relate to their true beliefs. So here what's happened is been given conditional assessments saying suppose the first one was true, what was what, 6%, what, what are the other categories? Now we're talking about unconditional probabilities instead. Do these match up with his opinions? Um, he can make adjustments if he needs to, and at the end of the day, we'll end up with some distribution. Um, other things we've done, though, here we haven't had any covariates. You can clearly have covariates as well, um, and in, in, we've got methods for doing that. The other thing we've done is we've got methods for generalized linear models and all the multivariate linear models as well. Um, a thing about these models is that they are giving more flexibility. They're, they're piecewise models. So we're, we're picking out a number of different knots. Each of these points is a knot. And between them, they're, they're linear, but we're allowing the shape to be much more flexible than you would rather than just a single straight line to them.